Hi everybody, I hope this video finds you well. Uh, in today's video, we're going to be continuing on with our introduction into hypothesis testing and confidence intervals by looking at a couple more uh, procedures that we can sort of run when our data sets are a little bit different than what we've been seeing so far. Uh, thus far, in the last few videos, you guys have been seeing how to run different one-sample mean procedures. You learned how to do a one-sample mean hypothesis test and a one-sample mean confidence interval. And in the very last example, we sort of saw how while the confidence interval is used for estimation and the hypothesis test is used for analyzing whether or not there's evidence to support a particular claim, the two procedures are pretty related. Now we're going to change gears a little bit and actually look at new procedures based on different types of data. Data sets. So we're going to begin by looking at how to do what are called two sample mean procedures. So this is going to be when we have two samples of quantitative data. And then we're going to look at sort of a very special case, which is sort of like a two sample mean procedure, but it's when you have matched samples. And we'll actually see that it relates back to a type of experiment that we discussed way at the beginning of our class, the matched pairs experiment. So this video will be mostly setting up the different procedures couple hypothesis tests and a couple confidence intervals, and then the following videos after this will give you guys some examples of those. So let's jump right in and take a look at this. The first one we're going to be discussing is what is called the two-sample mean hypothesis test. So this hypothesis test is used when you have two separate samples of quantitative data from two different populations that you want to compare. So you'll notice that it's used for something very different than our one sample mean procedure. Our one sample mean procedure was used when you had a sample of data that you wanted to compare against a known or assumed average. Here in the two sample mean, what we're actually doing is we're comparing samples two separate samples from two different populations. So this is the type of test when you might want to compare the average for men for some variable against the average for women for that variable. Or maybe the average for some variable for US adults versus the average for that same variable for adults from a different country. So we're going to be now talking about two different populations and we'll have two separate samples. Everything still will be quantitative data, so all the variables we'll be discussing in our examples will always be quantitative variables. So let's talk about how you'll set this up. So for the null hypothesis, right, the null hypothesis is going to be the baseline assumption. What the null hypothesis is going to be is that we're going to make an assumption that the our baseline sort of background belief is going to be that the average from each population is going to be equal. So in notation, we'll write that as mu1 equals mu2. In other words, we're basically saying until we have any other information, we believe that the average from the two populations should be equal. For your alternate, uh, you will get to choose whether or not you think that the average from population one should be greater, less than, or simply not equal to the average from the second. Once again, if you decide to use a greater than or a less than, we will call that a one-sided test. Whereas if you use the not equal to, we will call that a two-sided test. So this part here is the same as what we talked about in the one sample. If you use a particular direction, we call it a one-sided test. If it's simply not equal to, you use a two-sided test. So the hypotheses here are actually a little bit easier to set up because there's no value to figure out. The null is always going to be that the two populations have the same average, whereas the alternate, you will need to make a decision between do you want to use a greater than, less than, or not equals to. Okay, let's talk about the set of conditions. Well, the set of conditions actually turns out to be basically the same as the one sample mean procedure, but you need to check it for both samples. So you'll notice that all the conditions are just the standard conditions, but repeated twice. So we'll need both samples to be random and representative. We'll need both samples to be less than 5% of their respective population sizes. This is important though, it's each sample size compared against its own population size. And then third and finally, you need either both samples are approximately normally distributed. So if you did this, you might have to draw two separate stem and leaf plots, or you can simply have enough data in each sample. So you would need sample size one to be greater than or equal to 30 and sample size two to be greater than or equal to 30. So if you look back over your notes, these three conditions are the same conditions as we had for the one sample procedure. We're just repeating them twice, once for each sample. All right. What about the test statistic? Well, test statistic is still going to be a t-test statistic. Remember, the t-test statistic comes from the t-distribution, which we're using because we have to estimate population standard deviations with sample standard, standard deviations. So we're still going to continue to use that t-distribution. 
The test statistic itself is going to be the difference in the sample averages, so x1 bar minus x2 bar, divided by this pretty messy expression down here. This is s1 squared over n1 plus s2 squared over n2, which is the sample standard deviation from the first populate from the first sample squared divided by the first sample size. That's this plus the second sample standard deviation squared divided by the second populate for second sample size. So let's just for the sake of reference, let's go ahead and make a little list of all these things. So x1 is the sample one average, s1 is the sample one standard deviation, and n1 of course is sample one uh, size, and then x2 bar is the same stuff, the, in this case the average, but for sample two, s2 is the sample two standard deviation and n2 is the sample two size. So once again, you'll notice that the numerator is sort of measuring the difference, how different were the, how different were the two sample averages. And then the denominator is sort of measuring the amount of variation we would expect, except it's what in statistics, if you ever take a more advanced course, is actually called a pooled standard deviation because we're sort of grouping the two samples together there. Okay. P-value. How do we calculate the p-value? Well, since it's a test statistic of t, we will be needing to use table c. Remember, to use table c, you're going to need a degrees of freedom. Uh, degrees of freedom is usually the sample size minus one. The only trouble here is that we have two different sample sizes. So what we do is we choose the minimum of those two sample sizes and then still subtract one. So you pick the smaller sample size and then subtract one as you normally would. When you go on to read table C, you would use either the one-sided p-value or the two-sided p-value based on the HA that you chose. So if you used a greater than or less than, it would be a one-sided p-value. If you used the not equal to, it would be a two-sided p-value. As always, if the test statistic is negative, you'll think about it in absolute value. And if the degrees of freedom cannot be found, you round down to the nearest available degrees of freedom. Last part, conclusion. While the conclusion is the most important part in terms of the actual sort of procedure, it's the also the part that never changes. So if the p-value is less than alpha, we will be rejecting HO, which means we have significant evidence for our claim HA. Whereas if the p-value is greater than alpha, we will fail to reject HO, which means we do not have significant evidence for our claim, the alternative hypothesis. So this right here gives you guys your second type of hypothesis test, which is the two sample mean hypothesis test. Remember, Remember, again, this is what you would use when you have two separate samples from two different populations with quantitative data. There is a corresponding confidence interval for this hypothesis test, so let's jump right in and talk about that as well. This is what is called the two-sample mean confidence interval. So you can sort of think about this as the corresponding confidence interval. What is this confidence interval used for? Well, it's used uh, when you want to estimate the average difference between two populations based on two separate samples of quantitative data. So basically, this is the confidence interval you would run when you have two separate samples of quantitative data, and your goal is not to estimate the average in one particular sample. That would be a one sample mean confidence interval. But instead, you want to estimate the average difference. So maybe you've already run a hypothesis test and found that the average for men is different than the average for women. This confidence interval would then be used to figure out how large that difference actually is on average. So let's talk about the conditions because remember that for a confidence interval, it's only a two-step procedure, conditions and construction. The conditions here, I'm not gonna actually read through them. They're actually the exact same as the hypothesis test. So these conditions here are the exact same as the two sample mean hypothesis test. Actually, it will be a theme for most of the confidence intervals we learned in this class. Only actually there's one exception that we'll see after exam three. But for the vast majority of the confidence intervals we see in this class, the conditions for those confidence interval match the conditions for the corresponding hypothesis test. How do we do the construction here? Well, we will use the difference in the sample averages, x1 bar minus x2 bar as the point estimate. So in other words, we will take the difference of the averages in the samples and use that as our guess. And then we will calculate the margin of error using t star times the square root of s1 squared over n1 plus s2 squared over n2. I'm not going to rewrite what x1 bar, x2 bar, s1, n1, s2, n2 all are. They're the same notation as what we talked about on the previous page. But I will make a note here. Remember that t star you get this from table C, 
And remember what you're going to be doing here is you're going to need degrees of freedom, which is still going to be the minimum of n1 and n2 minus 1. And you'll need your confidence level, uh, which will be set in the problem, of course, and you'll intersect those to find your t star. So you'll still be finding t star in the same way. Once again, uh, as we start to do examples in later videos, uh, when you sort of build this confidence interval, remember this confidence interval is an estimate not for the difference between individuals, but for the average difference between the populations. So it'll have some of the same restrictions in terms of how we understand this. Okay, so now you guys have seen a new hypothesis test and a new confidence interval. Normally, we would jump right into some examples of this, but I want to compare and contrast this to another type of hypothesis test. So before we do any sort of examples, we're going to learn one more hypothesis test and one more confidence interval. And then in our future videos, we'll be able to not only practice these, but we'll also practice identifying which procedure is the appropriate one to use. So let's go ahead and talk about two more things here. So first, we're going to talk about another hypothesis test. This is what is called the matched, hairs, matched pairs hypothesis test. The matched pairs hypothesis test is a very special hypothesis test in that it is used only when you have a very special type of data, data that comes from a matched pairs study. So this hypothesis test is used when you want to compare two samples still of quantitative data, so everything's still quantitative here, but that come from a matched pairs study. Remember, a matched pairs study is generally some sort of experiment or study where you bring people in, you test them, then you do something to them or you change some behavior or you treat them in some way, and then you test them again. And that's why it's so special is that even though you have two samples, really the two samples are two samples of sort of the same group of people. You're just testing them twice. So this means in terms of identifying a matched pairs hypothesis test, you will often look for data that has a before and an after or a test one and test two. When you run the hypothesis test, even though we're going to lay out all the steps below here, what you should really be thinking is that it is effectively a one sample mean hypothesis test on the differences. In other words, the data that you're going to be using when you run one of these matched pairs hypothesis tests is not what happened on the before. It's not what happened on the after. It's the difference. It's basically how differently each person performed between the first test and the second test. So let's get into talking about the hypotheses. A little bit of different uh, structure here, just because when you're running a match pairs hypothesis test, you want to remind people that you're discussing the differences in how people perform. So we're going to use a little bit of different notation. We're going to use a letter D here. So the null hypothesis is going to be D equals some value. So we're going to be back to needing to have some baseline assumption. And then our alternate is again going to be that we think that the difference is going to be greater than, less than, or simply not equal. To that null hypothesis value. And once again, the same value will go in those two spots. Same value. We'll also use the same language. If you use a greater than or a less than, we'll call that one-sided. And if we use a not equal to, we'll call it two-sided. One other sort of note here that just is a little bit special, so I'll just sort of put it in stars over here. I uh, Sometimes match pairs is used to detect if there is a difference, right? It isn't being used to detect how large of a difference, just if there is a difference. And in that case, you will often use a null hypothesis where the difference is zero, right? Because if you were sort of testing whether just whether or not something didn't made any sort of difference, well, then your baseline assumption is that it didn't make a difference. And if there is no difference, then numerically we would write that as D equals zero. So we'll see some of that in later examples where we'll be using match pairs to just detect if there was some difference. And then you will have to recognize that that means we'll need to set that null hypothesis to be zero. The conditions here should be pretty familiar. The samples will need to be random and representative. The sample size must be less than 5% of the population. The only thing that's a little bit interesting is that in part three, we're reminded we don't actually care about the original data sets. What we care about is that the differences are approximately normally distributed, or of course, as usual, if we have more than more equal to or more than 30 data points. The test statistic is still going to remain a t-test statistic. It's got a little bit of different notation. We're going to be doing d bar minus d. Uh, divided by SD over root N. This test statistic should look familiar. It's very similar to what we did in the one sample mean procedure. What do all these different variables represent? Well, D bar is going to be your sample average of the differences. 
So when you're running one of these tests, you will not bother calculating like the average for the before or the average for the after. Instead, all you're gonna be interested in is the average of the differences, and that'll be represented as d bar. D, of course, will be the null hypothesis. S sub D is just going to be the sample standard deviation of the differences. And N is going to still be your sample size. So what you'll notice here is that if you go back and you compare this against the one sample mean procedure, this is actually identical to the one sample mean procedure, except that now we are applying it to the differences. So the average and the standard deviation apply not to one of the individual data sets, but to the differences overall. Okay, now let's go ahead and talk about the p-value. Very standard for calculating the p-value. You're still gonna use table C. You're gonna use your degrees of freedom to be n minus one, one-sided or two-sided based on the alternate. Once again, if the test statistic is negative, you're gonna use absolute value. If the degrees of freedom can't be found, you just round it down. Conclusion, this part for every hypothesis test we learn in this class will remain the same. If the p-value is smaller than alpha, we will reject HO and say that we have significant evidence for HA. If the p-value is greater than alpha, we will fail to reject HO, and that means we have no evidence for HA. All right, so this is now your third hypothesis test. It's a very specialized one. It is really only applied when you have that matched pairs data. There is a corresponding confidence interval for this, so let's go ahead and briefly discuss that as well. So this is what is called the matched pairs confidence interval. This confidence interval is used when you want to estimate the average difference in two samples that come from a matched pair study. So once again, this would be used to estimate, if you were running a matched pair study, how big of a difference you were observing. So it sort of goes hand in hand with the corresponding hypothesis test. Uh, conditions here are exactly the same, so we'll just make a note of that, right? Same as hypothesis test. So, uh, sample must be random and representative, sample size must be less than 5% of the population size, and the differences either need to be normally distributed or you need to have equal to or more than 30 data points. The construction, well, you will use the average of the sample differences, that will be your point estimate here. And then you will have a margin of error that will be T star times SD over root N, D bar, SD, and square root N. Well, those are all things just like we said. We know that this is going to be the average of the sample differences. This is going to be the sample standard deviation of the differences. This is the sample size. T star, still going to grab that from table C as well. That'll be table C. You'll look up your degrees of freedom, which in this case will just be N minus 1. You'll find your confidence level, intersect those, and that'll give you your T-star value. So in summary, in this video, we've introduced you guys to basically two more hypothesis tests and two more confidence intervals. Both of them still, uh, all of them still relate to quantitative data, and they all relate to two samples of quantitative data. The big difference is that the two sample procedure is used when those two samples are really two separate samples from two separate populations, whereas the matched pairs uh, procedures, those are used when you have two matched pairs of data, and you sort of want to examine the differences in the, how one individual performed before versus how they performed after. In the next set of videos, we'll be doing some examples of running these procedures and helping you guys identify between which one you should choose given a particular data set.